All right, so welcome to the final chapter in the book. This is going to be chapter 20, and we are going to discuss the environmental section of the course. Now, there is not going to be a lot of environmental issues that you will be dealing with unless you go into commercial real estate, which please understand that you are getting the license to go into commercial if you choose to do that. It is the same license in Indiana. So there's going to be a lot more environmental issues in the commercial world when you start dealing with offices and industrials and retail and gas station and convenience stores, more so than you are probably going to be dealing with in the residential world. Matter of fact, in the residential world, there's probably only going to be two, maybe a third one, then we'll talk about those today. All right. So now the next part of this is, <coughs> while I choke myself to death, remember, we are not environmental engineers, but under our fiduciary responsibilities, we are supposed to take care of our client so that they don't get harmed. But here's the cool thing. The extent of your care may simply be, dude, we better call somebody. I've done my job. All right. That is probably to the extent that you are going to uh, take care of your client. You're not an environmental engineer. You're not going to have to remember how to remediate methyl ethyl death. But your job should be at least, hey, I remember that word in class. That's probably not a good word. Why don't we call an environmental company? I have done my job and warned him. But to that extent, that's about it, okay? So remember that, that while we go through a lot of this stuff here, you are not going to be environmental engineers. Your biggest kick is probably just going to be, hey, call somebody. Call a remediation company, call an environmental uh, engineer company. Other than that, I can't really help you. So on page 403, there's a really cool little drawing of a house. And all in that house, it shows all these potential hazards that you can run into. And we're going to talk about a couple of them today. And we're going to start with asbestos. Asbestos is a, uh, believe it or not, it is a rock. But the problem is it can be woven into material like asbestos gloves, those fire suits, old uh, potholder mittens, um, brakes. Uh, it used to be in the fire code to spray in buildings because it was very fire resistant. And then we found out, no, nope, it causes problems. All right. So the asbestos, the biggest problem with asbestos is what it's called friable. It's the word in the book. Friable means it's easily broken up into dust and particles. And the problem with that is, if you break it into dust or particles, it floats up in the air and then you breathe it in and that is where the issue is. You don't want to move asbestos. So the key term for remediation is in your book, it is called encapsulation. You want to cover it up, encapsulate it. You don't want to move it, all right? They used asbestos pipe wrap on pipes for heating. Well, they used to be people would go, oh, it's asbestos. They'd go in and rip it out, put new uh, pipe wrap around it to insulate it. Well, the, the actual act of ripping it off the pipe would get in your breathing zone, and that was the problem. So now the new methodology in the last 10 years or 15 is encapsulated. You got pipe wrap, just put more pipe wrap over that. Don't move it. All right. Probably in one of your grandmother's houses, 
in the kitchen. They had the big black and white tiles that were on the floor, the big square checkered tiles. Those were asbestos, most of them. And then the, what this thing called mastic, which was the glue that held the tile to the ground, how it held so strong was the fibers of asbestos and then rehabbers would come in and say, oh, let's change the floor. And they'd start, start scraping up the floor and it'd get in the air and it would breathe out and breathe it in. So what you want to do is just put a new floor on top of it, encapsulate it, put the new polyurethane floor on top, put a new carpet on it, don't move it. There is asbestos shingle tiles. If anybody's ever seen them, they're big and gray and they look like, sh and they're shingles on the exterior of the house. I grew up in a house that had that, hadn't bothered me yet. All right, you don't wanna take the shingles off. Just put the new vinyl siding over the top of it. All right, so the key remediation to asbestos is called encapsulation. You want to just cover it up, all right? So that's asbestos. You will probably deal a little bit with asbestos if you start dealing in older homes. There may be some. The next one is probably the number one environmental concern that you will deal with completely in your career. Lead-based paint. Lead-based paint. All right. On the next page, well, we'll get there in a second. Lead-based paint causes a reaction in humans the same for every human. We can actually measure a person's exposure based upon uh, certain biofactors. We can sample their blood, we can take a bone biopsy, but it affects all humans the same. The problem is where it affects the human, like the brainstem, the growth platelets and bones, Things like that are still forming in children. So we are typically more concerned about the children's exposure to lead-based paint, but it literally can still harm an adult. Anybody see the movie Tommy Boy? In the movie Tommy Boy, Rob Lowe asks um, Chris Farley as he's being stupid, Rob Lowe goes, did you eat a lot of paint chips when you were a kid? because that's what he's inferring to is that inhibiting of the growth of the brain stem. So we are more worried about children's exposure, but literally adults can still be exposed. And the date that you should emblazon upon your brain for the rest of your career is 1978. Any house built in 1978 or before has exposure to lead-based paint. Now, do we still make lead-based paint? The answer is yes, we do, we still use it. We don't use it in residential construction. They use it still on the bridges potentially, machinery, because lead makes paint hold its color longer and dry quicker. For those of us, nobody in here is really that old except me. I remember lead in gasoline and they took it out in 1978 as well because lead helped the gas dry quicker so that there wasn't as much water in it. And we took that out and we used to, now it's funny, I laugh, because you would go in and get gas and they would say leaded or unleaded. And now they say regular and what they're meaning is regular unleaded as opposed to the premium because when I first started driving, regular meant leaded gas. We don't have that anymore, all right? So 1978 is the date that you should remember, all right? It came about because of all of the diseases to children and they finally tracked it down. Now, what I want you to look at first is the form on page 406, all right? Now, I have told you repeatedly in this course that we are not going to look at any of the forms. Here is the one exception. We will go over this form because this is a federal 
disclosure. Every state in the United States uses the same form and it's the only mandated federal disclosure that we have in residential that is across the board the same for Wisconsin, Louisiana, Indiana, all of them. While our purchase agreements that we've seen throughout the book, I've said, ah, it's not ours, no. This is the one form that's the same, all right? So let's look at it real quick. The one thing I want you to notice, look at the, there's a top section, letter A, that is filled out by the seller when you list the property. The seller will fill out section A and B. Now notice A1 says, I have records of lead-based paint. And A2 basically says, I have, or one says, A1 says, I have knowledge. And A2 says, I have no knowledge. Notice it does not say there is no lead-based paint. All right. It's like going to court. When you go to court, they find you guilty or not guilty. There is never a, a grounds for innocent. No, we either found you guilty or we did not have enough information to find you guilty. So you're either proven guilty or not guilty. Here's the same thing. Either I have knowledge or I don't have knowledge. It doesn't say there is no lead-based pain. It just says I have no knowledge of it. All right? This is the one law where ignorance is bliss. You guys have heard of the term, ignorance is no excuse for the law. This is the one case that's actually not true. You are, to, you are allowed to not know. I don't know. So A1 and A2 says, I have knowledge, I have no knowledge. B1 and B2 says, I have records of the knowledge or I have no records. So you would hope your client would check A2, I have no knowledge, and B2, I have no records. So that's what the seller would give. Now, if you are the, a, a selling agent and you're going to write an offer, you are going to ask the listing agent for this form and he's going to send it to you as the selling agent, remember working with the buyer, and you're going to see the seller's declaration of A2, B2. Means he has no knowledge and no records of lead-based paint. The middle section, C, D, and E, those are filled out by your buyer and return this form back to the listing agent when you send the purchase agreement. Now, Side note, we've touched on it already a little bit. The seller will also send that seller's disclosure form dictating, hey, the property is you know, working, not defective, all of that. So when you make an offer, before you make the offer, you actually have to get the seller's disclosure from the listing agent and you will get the lead-based paint disclosure, i.e. this form right here so that your buyer can look at what the seller's claiming is defective and working and not working and what the seller's claiming about lead-based paint, okay? So when you write the offer, you send back the offer. You also would send back this form with the buyer checking letter C, D, and E. C says that he has received the records. This form, and here this is a, vicious cycle. This form's one of the records. So the fact he received this form, he would check on this form that he received this form. Makes no sense. How do you, how would you check it somewhere else if you didn't? So you check on this form. Yes, I received all the information above. And then letter D says he has received the pamphlet from HUD called lead-based paint protection in your family whatever it is, it's gone through several iterations. Now, this could be something that you would supply to your buyer. Now, I'm telling you in this days of technology, here's what typically happens. In the listing agreement, 
the listing agent will upload these two forms, the seller's disclosure and the lead-based paint, as part of the listing so that when you're looking on the MLS, you can just download them for your client to give to him. And then probably what you would do as a smart agent is go out to HUD, find the lead-based paint form, it's in PDF, save it on your computer so that every time you send this information to your buyer client, you would also just attach that other form and send him all three of them at one time. Very common, very easy, all right? So you would send him this form, you would send the seller's disclosure form, you would send this booklet to him or the directions to, hey, here's the link to HUD, you can go get it if you want. Uh, I would probably give it to him. That way you can at least have an email link saying I sent him the booklet. All right. 